I don't know if pastors are supposed to have favorite passages from the Bible, and I will say I don't have just one favorite, but this one makes maybe the top 20 list. So listen to the word of God as it comes to us from the gospel of Mark, the first gospel in our New Testament, chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. Listen to God's word. On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. Jesus said to the disciples, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we turn to you in this hour of worship because we long to draw near to you, to sense your presence, to feel your peace. Be with us now. We pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts may be acceptable to you, Almighty God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The practice of naming tropical storms and hurricanes actually goes back to the early 19th century when hurricanes in the West Indies were named after the saint upon whose feast day they occurred. Now, it wasn't until World War II that the Army and Navy meteorologists began using names for the storms they were plotting across the Pacific Ocean. And from here, name lists for hurricanes and tropical storms have evolved since then. As we may know, there are name lists in rotation for different regions of the world and patterns by which these names are selected and rotated and even retired. And I don't know if it feels exciting or daunting when one of our names is chosen to name a storm. There was a storm named Heather a few months ago. But why name storms? As people, we usually try to name that which we treasure or that or those to whom we relate. We name our children. We name our pets, our land, and some people even name their vehicles. Or we name something that we believe will last, a building, a river, a work of art. And storms are neither of these things. They are fleeting and troubling and often over as soon as they start. They can be claimed by no one and they are not of human making. So why do we name storms of all things? Well, according to the National Hurricane Center, we name storms because it helps. Names make it easier for people to talk about storms, whether meteorologists or emergency responders or everyday citizens. As we know, there may be more than one storm happening at a time. 
And so talking about storms by name allows us to more easily communicate about the storm so that we can understand what's happening, recognize its impact, and figure out a plan forward. Now, I myself have not found myself in the path of a hurricane. My in-laws did flee Hurricane Sandy on the same day they left our house, driving home to pick up their cats and turning around in New Jersey to come back to stay with us till power was restored. Now, although I have not personally encountered a named storm, I have been known to name the storms I encounter in my own life. You have heard me speak of the season of cancer, COVID, and heart attacks that marked my family's life in 2022. And naming that storm and saying it out loud helped make it easier to talk about the hard things, to speak out loud what was really happening, and to chart a way forward. Naming storms, no matter what that storm may be, helps us to plot out our days, to plot the important parts, the hard parts, to articulate priorities, to also name the things in the storm that are the things of which we, over which we have no control, to choose with intention that of which we must let go. Naming a storm helps to situate the storm, as big or as small as it might be in the larger story of our life together, whether that storm comes in the form of a conflict or a broken bone or simply a season of great confusion. We have all encountered storms. We have all had seasons in our lives where the landscape of our life is marked with loss or conflict or unmet needs, where fear is the predominant emotion and where, although the particular circumstances may change, there's a universal understanding that these seasons are unsettling at best and earth-shattering at worst. Storms are unequivocally uncomfortable, and storms are unequivocally a part of life. Now, I don't know if the storm that covered the sea that day had a name, but I know that there was something so remarkable about the story we heard in these few short verses about a stormy night at sea that we are talking about this storm still today. Now, frankly, I don't think that the storm over the sea was a particularly remarkable storm. Storms are commonplace over the sea, especially over nighttime waters. The disciples were experienced fishermen and sailors, and they would know that this would be true as they boarded their boats at Jesus' instruction and headed over to the other side. I also don't think it is odd that Mark told us about Jesus' ability to calm the waves. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that although Mark is economic with his words, he is intentional to point out that the word of God, who brought order to the chaos of the waters at creation, is the word of God who, in Jesus, calms the chaos of the stormy waters of our lives. Jesus' way of acting upon the world has a power that belongs to God alone, and Mark wants to make sure we know that is true, but frankly, that is not surprising either. That is a part of the larger story that Mark is telling us in his gospel. Jesus is who Jesus is, the Son of God, the Son of Man. Miracles happen wherever he goes, and anything is possible through him. But there is something so surprising about this storm that we read about this storm in Scripture. And I don't know about you, but the element of this passage that I find most surprising is Jesus' ability to sleep through the storm. I can barely sleep when it is windy outside and I'm sleeping in a bed under covers 
with walls around me. But I also can barely sleep when my to-do list feels 10 miles long and I lie awake trying to figure out how to establish priorities and chart my way through the next day. But Jesus sleeps through the storm. Now part of me wonders, frankly, if the disciples actually maybe carried a sleeping Jesus onto the boat. Mark is known for adding little odd details to his gospel narrative, like that people were sitting on green grass or that someone ran away naked. These details that catch you by surprise and you're not quite sure what they're doing there, but they're there nonetheless. And this text has one of those details tucked inside where he says that the disciples took Jesus just as he was on the boat. And I can't help but wonder what that might mean. Was Jesus mid-sentence and the disciples were pulling him onto the ship? Was Jesus dripping with sweat or in the middle of taking a bite and they said, Jesus, come on, get on the boat, you can finish your meal aboard? Or was Jesus already asleep and the disciples picked up their rabbi and carried him onto the boat they prepared? I don't know, but I'll throw it out there. What seems odd to me in this whole story is not only that Jesus was asleep through the storm, but frankly, he does not seem particularly concerned with the storm at all. He remains unfazed by the storm as if to say it is what it is. Storms happen on nighttime seas. Boats rock against raging winds and Yes, a storm might make safe passage difficult, and it's reasonable to be scared, but storms are a part of life. They come and they go, and we shouldn't expect anything different. And so we see Jesus taking a nap. He takes care of himself after a very long day of teaching. He readies himself for the work that lies ahead when they get to the other side. He restores his body and relaxes his mind and let the waves rock him as he sleeps. I don't know about you, but I think that we may have a lot to learn from these few short verses. At least I do. For we do see that God is a God who is with us always. We see that God alone has the power to calm the raging sea, and we see that fear can distract us from the hope of our faith and disorient us from the larger truth of our place in a larger story. But I can't help but wonder if one takeaway from this story is less about our need to invite Jesus to show up and meet us in the storms we encounter, and more about Jesus inviting us to meet him in the calm. We are so often akin to the disciples trying to make our way through rough waters only to grow discouraged and afraid. Our shoulders tense and our eyes widen and we try our hardest. But as much as we push our way through, we are only faced with our continued inability to stop the storm around us. And so our lives are plagued with fear, We get scared, we cry out to Jesus, and he does join us where we are, but issues a reminder to us, don't be afraid, have faith, I'm here. Maybe the point of this story is not that Jesus has a job to get rid of the storms in our lives, but rather that Jesus can show us how to make our way through. So what might be this plan? Well, frankly, I think Jesus is telling us all to take a nap. Get some rest. Lie down. Don't exhaust yourself. Save your energy for the work that is yours to do. Focus on some self-care that is reasonable. You can't take on the storm, but you can Take care of yourself. 
So I think there's an invitation to get some rest. Second, I think that Jesus is reminding us that storms are temporary. They will pass. There is an other side, and God is calling each one of us forward to what comes next. And what's more, regardless of the landscape of the journey, whether it's filled with smooth terrain or rocky waves, God is with us and all of God's people every step of the way. We can expect God to travel with us. And finally, I think that Jesus invites us to claim an interior space of calm when there is no foothold for calm in the world around us. I think Jesus is reminding us that the peace that comes from God, that peace that surpasses all understanding of which he speaks, is not contingent upon external circumstances. The world does not have to go our way and life does not have to be easy for us to know the peace of God. Rather, Jesus' own ability to sleep on rocky seas from, comes from a calm he has within, a calm that comes from the knowledge and trust in God's promises regardless of the circumstances that life has to offer. Jesus points us to this deeper truth too. He reminds us what we have learned throughout the years from mystics since then, that abiding peace, inner calm, true, a true sense of safety are gifts available to us at all times and in all circumstances, not because we can flip a switch or change the things that are outside of our control, but because by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can rest in the promises of God. This trust, this faith, amends the story to remind us that we are not simply at the mercy of the turbulent seas around us, but that we are held forever in the arms of a merciful God. God is with us always on, on mountaintops and rocky seas. God does not forsake us. See, storms, no matter how big or scary or difficult to navigate, are just that. They are storms. They do impact our journey. They do generate fear and grief, they exhaust us. They are hard, don't get me wrong. And they are temporary, and there is another side. Through the storm of COVID, cancer, and heart attacks, I was relentlessly confronted with the reality of my own inability to control the world, or at least my little corner of it. Now, for a busy body like myself, that might sound like adding my greatest fear on top of my greatest struggle. But this truth was a source of calm, for I was continually reminded that God is God and I am not, and which I already knew, but sometimes we need those reminders. But this truth gave me the courage to let go of the things that were outside of my control and freed me to be purposefully present to that which was mine to do. And this truth reminded me of the hope of our faith that we all are a part of something bigger than any storm that is raging around us, that we at all times and in all circumstances are held in the love of God that was and is and forever will be more powerful than any storm we would face, even the storm of death. Friends, today may we hear the good news. Regardless of the way the winds may blow or the name of the storms you encounter in your lives, we too are held in the grasp of a loving God who has not and will not let us go. May we find hope in the promises of Christ, knowing that we are loved, knowing that God is with us, 
knowing that God's love is stronger than even death, may we find peace in the promises of God. May it be so. Amen.